Welcome to the first episode in the game programming series. Um, I did an introduction episode on what this series is about. Obviously, it's about programming games. Um, more specifically, it's about programming the Rusty Rockets games game that I'm working on. Uh, go watch the introduction episode if you want to know more about what I'll be covering in this series, um, uh, some of the topics that we'll be covering, the way I'll be covering them. Um, but for this first episode, I want to start with a concept, uh, a very important concept for games called the game loop. Um, now, I will be. This will be a, a relatively short episode. I will do multiple episodes on this concept. We will build a game loop from start to finish, and it will be the actual game loop that I'll be using in the Rusty Rockets game. Now, obviously, the game loop will advance as we move on to other subjects and uh, things that don't work out as we plan them to. So we'll get back to the game loop uh, in, in potentially in future episodes, but definitely in between episodes when I need to tweak something or fix something. But we're going to start with a simple game loop. Um, and from there on out, we will we are going to build uh, this game over the course of uh, many, many episodes. So before I start, uh, I would like to uh, point out this uh, awesome book, Game Programming Patterns uh, by Robert Nystrom. Um, now, I've ordered this book, uh, a hard copy um, uh, for me to read, but there is also a, a free uh, online version available. And so you can just read it on the web. It's, uh, it, it has a beautiful layout. Uh, it's easy to read. Um, so I would highly recommend you, you check out this book. Um, now I've been, I've read some of the, uh, the stuff on the, on the game loop. Uh, I plan on reading the whole book from start to finish once I get it. Um, I love uh, uh, just having paper books. As I've mentioned, I've also, I'm also reading the uh, program Rust book. And as you can see, I just like uh, making notes, uh, marking stuff inside the book on things that I, I think are important and also adding some uh, notes on the top of specific subjects in the book. Uh, so I plan on doing that with game program patterns as well. Um, but I've read a couple of things about the game loop. I'm not an expert yet. That's what that's what this series also is about, about me learning these concepts and working with them. Um, so yeah, so let's just dive right in. So my first of all, my idea was to just quickly describe um, what a game loop is and what we're going to do. So I've got this canvas here uh, where I can draw on. I'm just going to try this out and see if this, this is nice to use. And if so, we can do it in a future episode as well. Uh, so let's just first start off. So we've got a game loop. And the first thing that we, uh, that we need to uh, talk about is what is an actual game loop? Well, Let's split up these, this word game loop into two words. So we've got the game and we've got the loop. And so what is what is a game? Well, a game, uh, it has uh, an audio component. It has a video component. And these two combined could also um, cover uh, a movie, for example. But what makes a game a game is that it's actually interactive. You can influence the outcome of the game by making decisions as a player. And so there is this concept of input. And so these three things together will actually, at a high level, could be uh, combined in saying like this, these three together are what's considered to be a game. Um, now, what is then a game loop? Well, let's, let's start with, um, uh, with the input. So let's say you're playing a game, a, a racing game, for example, and you're giving, uh, you're you're hitting the throttle, so you're going forward. So you're providing input to to the game. So when you provide in input, something happens with that input, and then based on that input, the screen will actually show you that your uh, car is moving forward. And so because the screen shows this to you, let's just uh, put a pair of eyes here, um, and because the screen shows this to you you actually see visually that you are moving forward. And based on that input, based on the input that, well, that the game gives back to you in terms of audio and video, you can actually provide input back to the game again. And so say, for example, you're driving forward and uh, in, the, in the distance you can see a turn coming up. Based on that input, you actually de decided, like I need to steer to the right to, to, to stay on the track. And so you're providing input back again to the game that you want to move to the right, and so as you can see, this is this is turning to this is turning into a loop where you're giving input, 
um, the the game does something with your input. It shows you the effect of that change, and then you base your next action on that visual change that you saw in the game. And so then we have this part here within the within the game loop where something actually needs to be done. And so this is where the actual state of the game is changed. So you provided input that you wanted to hit the throttle. So the change of the game was changed from, well, actually the car was at point zero. There was an input on giving uh, uh, going forward. And so now the car is at position one. And so the, the, the game is actually updated. And based on that update, the, um, the uh, output is, re is, is rendered to your screen. And so this is basically what the game loop is on a, in most simple terms. It's just a continuous loop of you providing input, the state of the game changing, and based on that change state, the game being rendered to your screen with audio and video um, for you to see and hear. And then based on that, you make another ch set of inputs that alter the game again. And so you've got this continuous loop here of the game continuously changing. So now let's, um, and so this is what we're going, what we're basically going to build here. But there are some interesting things here, and we'll be going deeper into the more interesting aspects of this game loop as we continue with uh, future episodes. But for now, um, let's um, let's take a look at at the game loop. So let's say we've got this timeline here, and we are uh, right here at zero, and so. First of all, what we do is we provide input to the game. So we've got this box of input here. And then based on that input, we are actually updating the game. So we've got an update. And then finally, based on that update, we are rendering the game. So we call render. And so as you can see, got this continuous step from input to update to render and then based on this rendering you go back to the beginning and you provide input again now this is something that um, let's take a let's take a, a text-based game for example um, a terminal based game where uh, in the old days you would see on a terminal you would see you're standing in the middle of a room to the right there is a door and to the left there is a window. Uh, which direction do you want to go? And you can either type in right or you can type in left. And so when you type in uh, uh, left to go to the window, the input would be left. And then the update part would say, all right, so the game state has to change because the character actually moved to the left of the, of the room towards the window. And so now the state of the game is that you are actually in front of the window. And so the rendering would change it would redraw the screen and you would see you actually standing in front of the window. And again, the uh, based on the update, the game now knows, well, actually you're in front of the window now and you could, the next actions you could take, you could, you can no longer move to the right because there's a, there's, I don't know, there's a wall, for example, which you can move tr through the window or you can move back to the position that you were previously in. And so you constantly have this update and this slow motion update where you provide some input, there is an update change, there's a render, and uh, you start at the, at the front again. Now, if you translate this to a racing game, a, a AAA racing game, for example, um, obviously things happen up in, at a much faster pace. So you hit the throttle, you start moving forward. It, ha it all happens in real time. Maybe you have a steering wheel as input device for your game. And so you start to steering to the right and the game actually, the, the car actually starts moving to the right and uh, follows the road as you, as you move to the right. And so all of this is happening in real time. Uh, and the the concept is still the same, where you have the input of the of the steering wheel, you have the update of the car actually changing positions as you move forward, and the rendering of you being shown that the car is actually moving on a track and uh, moving forward on the uh, on the track. Um, and so, but the difference is that the racing game has to update this at a much higher pace, and this is where uh, uh, the interest, interesting aspects of the game loop come into play because. In order for, for a game to be uh, real-time and realistic, you have to update it at an, a, a number of frames per second. Um, and in this case, uh, 
some uh, older consoles would render it at 30 frames per second, these times 60 frames per second. Um, you even have uh, 100 frames per second games, or in, in, in uh, with virtual reality, I think it's 144 frames where you don't get nauseated when you when you look around in, in, in the VR world. And so you have to, with 144 frames, or let's say let's take uh, the, the easy example of 100 frames per second. So you have to update this this loop has to happen every um, 100 frames per second. So FPS. So every 100 second, uh, sorry, every second, this loop has to happen 100 times. And so that means if you take a second, a second is 1000 milliseconds. So each loop can take 10 milliseconds at the most. And if it, if you want to have a steady 100 frames per second, you would say, well, um, actually after uh, five milliseconds, I'm already done with this loop. So what do you do? Well, you wait five milliseconds because you know that you need if you want to have this smooth 100 frames per second, you would um, um, do one loop every 10 milliseconds. But the interesting aspect is that um, the update and the render part in this case are actually tied together. So there's one update and then there's one render and then you get back to seeing if there's any input, if there is or if there isn't, doesn't really matter. You move to update again and you move to render again. But what if your system is not capable of actually rendering the game at 100 frames per second. What if the game is actually running right now at 100 frames per second, but some background application kicks in and it starts taking up the resources of your of your machine. Um, and so you would slow down to 50 frames per second. Well, so this means that also the update part of the of the of the game would slow down to 50, 50 frames per second. Um, and this is the update part is what what's called the updates per second. So the rendering would, would take place at 50 frames per second, the updating would take place at 50 updates per second, and so they are in lockstep with each other. Um, but what that means is that the actual outcome of the game differs based on the amount of updates that the game can produce within a single second. And this is where the concept of decoupling the updating and the rendering comes into play. Now, this is also something that I'm still learning, so uh, I won't go into too much depth here uh, uh, because I just might be wrong in, in my explanation and we'll go into that in, in future episodes while I'm reading up on this and while we're working on this. But the idea is basically that if you decouple the updating and the rendering, you could, um, you could say, well, I want to update at a fixed interval and I want to render at whatever capacity is left to render the game at. So say I want to, I want to instead of saying I want 100 updates per second, uh, frames per second, I'm going to say, well, I want, actually I want, um, sorry, I want 100 updates per second. And so when you, when you want to achieve 100 updates per second, you could say, well, that means that um, I need to uh, finish the update in 10 milliseconds. Um, but usually you update a lot faster. So say you update every five milliseconds. So that means, so let's see. So it means that you can update, you can run the updater more times for every, every loop in the game. So you could say, well, um, I've, got, um, I've got the input. I'm now going to update multiple times in order to achieve this 100 updates per second. And the time that, it's, that is left, I can use to render the game. And um, so your rendering um, it could still be at 100 frames per second. If you have a fast enough machine, it could even be higher than 100 frames per second. The updating would stay at 100 updates per second. Um, but even if the rendering went lower, went to 50 frames per second, for example, you would still, um, the update per second would still stay at the 100 updates per second. And this gives you a stable um, uh, amount of updates that happen and this is this makes it a lot easier for other systems in your in your game, uh, the AI, the physics, uh, other other uh, systems that that hook into your game to to uh, to work with with the with the update cycle because it's a it's a fixed update cycle, so it's a lot easier to to know when something is about to happen. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is something that we'll be diving in again in the future, and we'll go more in depth and explain more of this. Um, but for now, what we're going to do is we're going to start with implementing this simple game loop. Um, and from there on, uh, we're going to advance into, into more, uh, more uh, advanced game loop systems. 
So I'm going to um, shut this down, move it away. And let's see. So I'm going to start a new, uh, a new um, library, a Rust library. And so we're going to, let's see, um, it's going to be a binary. And we're going to call it Pocket Watch. And so, um, let's see. All right. So let's go to main. All right, so we've got um, So we can actually run this, yes. So let's see. So this is this is our in main we're going to actually run our loop. And so basically what we're going to do um, we're going to run this uh, for for a, a, num a, a fixed amount of uh, of times, and so let's see. Uh, let's see. Can we actually? How can we in Rust? Can we say for i? Mm, Let's move this here. Right, so let's say touch uh, rust format.toml so that we've got formatting enabled. So let's run this. So now we print hello world 10 times. And so we're going to, um, let's say, uh, let loops equals. 100 and so this will become loops and now we have 100 times hello world all right so we're going to uh, in order to uh, not have a continuous loop we're just going to loop a, a fixed amount of time and then we're going to exit the program and in the future uh, what you can imagine is that the loop will just continuously run until you click the exit game button and then there will be some signal to terminate this loop. In our case, we're just going to run for a fixed amount of loops. So let's see. So obviously the most simple implementation is that we, um, as I mentioned, we need to uh, get some input. So we've got an input function. Uh, we've got a, an update function and we've got a render function. And we're going to move those in here. Let's move, let's right away move the, um, the rendering in here. And so we'll first trigger the input, then we'll trigger the update, and then we'll trigger render. Let's save this, and basically we still have the same implementation. And I'm going to shorten this for now so that we just have, we print hello world 10 times and so this is basically on a super high level this is basically the uh, the most simple game loop that you can that you can get that you can build now we're not going to at least in this episode we're not going to worry about the input because basically what you um, what you need to do here is you need to listen to your operating system events um, you would create a so for example this terminal window that I that I have open here it creates a window and then whenever I, I do something, so I, I move my mouse and you can see on the screen the mouse moving, but in this case, when I uh, hit my keyboard, something happens on the screen in this terminal window because um, it receives uh, events from the operating system that the H key or the L key was actually pressed in this case. Um, and so that's uh, that's something that we're going to have to do in the future. But for now, we're just going to basically ignore the input. so you. You can't have any, um, you can't uh, have any input on on the outcome of this game right now. Um, so what we what we have is the update part and we have the random part. And so 
let's see. So what we eventually want to do, so this is now it's it's a binary, and eventually I would like this to be some kind of a library where um, we can use this library in our game, and it, it it remains its own crate, and we can just basically build this crate separately from the from the game, um, and we use it to actually run the, the game loop in our in our game itself. So for that, let's see. Let's say just that we're just going to create a struct called game loop, and um, what we need is we need a uh, what we want to, to encapsulate here is we want an, an updater in here, so that's an uh, whatever we want it to be, and we want a renderer. And so what we need here is we need to capture an updater and a renderer. And um, let's see. So we could actually, here we could say, let uh, game loop is game loop. And we pass in some information here. So we would say updater is, in this case, we could say update a renderer is render and um, and then in this in this section we could just call a uh, game loop dot uh, updater and game loop dot renderer so if we save this and we run this um, field not a method uh, oh, actually, this is indeed this is a field, not a method. So, uh, let's see. So we are creating them here, and well, actually, so let's see. So what we what we what you what we actually want is. Um, so in this case, right, so this, this is not calling the function itself. So, but what we want in this case is that we actually, we implement the game loop. Um, and first of all, we can make the, um, let's see, we can say, what we actually want is we want a a, a trait called um, updater, for example, and this trait should have a function called update, and that's it. We can do the same trait renderer, and this has a render function, and so now we can actually we can say where u is updater and R is renderer, so we, we expect to have some kind, uh, some type that implements updater or implements renderer. And uh, let's see, and so in this case, when you, where you updater are renderer, and so what we, we'd have to do here is uh, we could say, let's see. So we we could create a a struct called update. Actually, we we would probably create a let's see, we create a world um, which has a, a u size. And we would then say imp impl updater for world. And in here we would basically just implement the updater. Now we do want to have this uh, be on self. And so 
to know it's self, actually reference to self. And similarly, we would uh, do impl renderer for world and render self. And here we would actually um, remove this. Here we can delete this. And save this. And so now when we create the, uh, so we'll create a, a renderer here. So let's say uh, updater equals updater. Um, this well actually it's uh we would create a hmm well if we created a world we would have a single object which we can then we could actually move as one object but let's split them up for now we'll see we'll see where we'll end up eventually but for now we're going to create a struct render use size and because we have the use size we can actually um we can do some stuff where we actually update the counter and see what, what actually happens. So we've got an update, we've got a render struct, and so here we we'll say update is update zero. And we'll do the same for render is render zero. And then here, we already have it here. And so now we pass this in. That doesn't. And so, when we get to here, well, we so we'll ignore the input for now. And so what we're actually going to do now, let's see. So we're going to call, we're going to create, uh, where is the impo for the game loop? Here it is. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a, a so-called tick, which is a self. And a tick basically moves the game loop forward one cycle so when we when we drew the the uh, the timeline so the tick goes from zero to the end of the timeline and then it, go, it goes again and so what we could do here is we could say well in this tick we actually want to uh, do uh, we want to call for the update we want to call uh, updater dot update and we want to call ren uh, renderer dot render and this needs to lowercase like this and so right here we would actually call game loop dot tick and this needs to be mutable so let's see what happens if we run this so now we we still get the same uh, result so we got hello world on the screen but now we can actually um, because we we have this update struct here, we can actually do something here. So we could say, for example, well, let's let's make this mute self. We could say, well, we actually want to update the first field uh, by incrementing it by one, and we could uh, do the same here, but we could increment it by two. And uh, let's see. Right, so these the trays actually need to uh, this need, needs to be commutable. Same here, and same uh, here. So the same would still happen, but now we could actually, for example, if we move this here, we could say, well, uh, let's print the value of self so if we run this again you could see that now the, the timer is actually incrementing or the the integer is incrementing so this this could represent us actually doing something with the state uh, of the game um so yeah so what you have here is a very very basic uh game loop so we are we are looping 10 times and for each loop we advance the tick and when we advance the tick something happens here and so in this case the um the uh, the 
in the case of update, we increment self by one, and in, in the case of render, we increment the, the, uh, the first uh, value of the tuple by two. Um, so, and so from here on out, we can actually expand this. So we can, uh, we can start working with, well, actually, so here we're calling update and render at the same time. And what we could do now is we could start um, taking into account the the time that we that the tick takes place, and then uh, recording that and using that to actually update more frequently than we do the rendering. Um, and we also just we also still need to do the uh, input processing. That's something that I'm going to do in the second episode. This is a really simple just to get us started. Uh, we've got the basic uh, the basic things down, and now what you what we still need to look into is. Um, in the in an actual game, you would have this. Uh, usually, you have this concept of the of a world object which contains the state of the game, basically. And so we would have to we'll have to look into: Do we want to have the update and render be separate objects, or should they be same objects? Should they be objects that live in the, in the world, the the higher level world object? So that's something that we'll get to. Um, I think in the next episode, we're going to focus on actually rendering something to the screen. Um, there are a couple of crates that we can use for this. I'm going to uh, figure out which one we can uh, work with. Uh, and then we're actually going to render something to the screen. I think we're going to start with just rendering the actual frames per second. Um, but as we move forward, we can actually start taking input. And then we can actually do some, some uh, like we mentioned with the text-based game, we can actually do something where you actually can control what's on the screen by, uh, by using the keyboard. Um, but that's for the next episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed this first one. It was a quick rundown of what a game loop is and a really simple um, implementation, not even a, a full fledged implementation uh, in Rust. And uh, the next episode, we're going to continue from here. Thanks for watching, uh, and I hope to see you in the next episode. Bye bye.